Uh, let's give it a sync. All right. Uh, welcome to the Monkey Dance Podcast. This is Ohan. This is Guillermo. And uh, we're doing something different today. We have two guests on. We're going to try for the first time. But if you've been listening, uh, you'll recognize the two guests. One is uh, Christina Vasic, who we had on episode 11. Hey there. And the other is Akush Segofi, who we had on episode 12. Hello. So we uh, wanted to get both of them on the podcast. We're not sure exactly what we're going to talk about yet. But a couple of months ago, we were in the same room for about half an hour, and the conversation was great. And then we were like, all right, we need to get everybody in the same room. So there, there are some loose themes that I really want to cover, particularly around information, uh, how information is sort of necessary for democracy, or maybe we can talk specifically about whether it is or why it's important. But one of the things that I was thinking about when thinking about what to say exactly right now in this moment is uh, how you, we can't really have equality without equal access to information where we can build some systems which try to build in equity. We can say that everybody has equal voting rights, which is you know another version of equality. But there's, there's something of a list that we would need to check off of items that would allow us to say that a system is equal. And that, of course, requires building in some, some metrics which would then uh, be more equitable, which are unequal in the short term, but looking to build in uh, equality in the long term. But information is interesting because something like access to information in the immediate moment, because information is constantly generated relative to the new cycle for democracy, you need to have immediate access for all the things. So there isn't, it's kind of interesting to think about like an equity for information kind of idea. I don't really know what that looks like. We've built in equity for things like access to education, for example, um, with things like affirmative action in the United States, very similar policies around the world. But I don't know what that looks like with regard to the internet or information at large. So maybe uh, if anybody wants to take up that thread, I can sort of kick it to one of you for any particular thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could. I think I could add something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, the first thing that comes to mind is um, information for what? So in the case of democracy, so what do you need information for? And then you can think about the, the system that best support the kind of information that's necessary for you to, to, to bring about uh, uh, um, a system that it's, uh, um, it's, has equity or equality. And um, I tend myself to to think that the problems that need to be solved um, should have uh, should be uh, sh should have a hierarchical concentrical uh, um, expansion. So first you have to to solve local issues, and being having access to information that helps you to solve local issues uh, uh, would be the 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 main uh, paradigm to be solved for me. But then you have kind of like very complex problems on on a on a large society that um require some kind of a require the consensus and and to to for action and to 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 for decisions to be made and in this case i think uh, being sure that some that everybody that is involved on the decision making process has access to the information that is relevant to solve a problem or an issue that's relevant for thousands millions of people it's it's I think the, the complexity is it's quite, it's, I think that might be there. Yeah, you have this historical problem where people were denied access to literacy. Mm -hmm. So even before things were published, when things were written down, people would safeguard, uh, at least I know in the Western world, it was usually religious clerics would safeguard the idea, the concept of the written word in a way to hold a political power. And then we have a situation where literacy has a boom in the last hundred years. More people can read, most people can read, and write, but then you also have this problem of misinformation. So this, I guess, is kind of where I see the meeting point of both of your areas of expertise, where you have uh, disenfranchisement of individuals explicitly, and then you have a disenfranchisement of individuals through information. And in the modern age, there's so much information that we hit a point where individuals are flooded with, with so much information, there's no way to sort of parse out what's actually uh, epistemically valid. And so what's happened is we've reached a situation where institutions themselves are doubted 
And then whatever institutions have power are the ones that are just deferred to because everybody just feels defeated. And so this is sort of a new way to, to carve out power in a, in a literate age where we've moved from information that is written down being the truth that's maintained by select few to there being so much information that the truth is entirely muddied and the, the truth becomes irrelevant. It's just the power structures of B that, that maintain everything. Right. There are so many things to unpack here, and I'm having so many associations. I'm sure this will be a fruitful discussion. But the first thing that came to my mind was that maybe different models of democracy uh, acquire, uh, require different levels of information. So if we focus on aggregative model of democracy, which is the most formal um, view of democracy that only requires equal voting rights, one person, one vote. Um, it basically only requires that you have enough uh, relevant and uh, valid information in regards to the representatives, if we are talking about uh, representative uh, democracy, uh, or in regard to the formal aspects of representation as an institution itself, how you are supposed to uh, elect, how you're supposed to vote, and uh, what are your options of disobedience or of, uh, you know, making those uh, who are not representing you uh, adequately step down later. Uh, of course, you need a lot of information here, but I think that you need even more information and different kind of information in the liberative model of democracy. So with the turn, um, with the rise of identity politics, we have a turn of um, deliberation in democracy, deliberative turn in democratic theory. And uh, with that turn, um, deliberative democracy uh, focuses on how preferences are not just calculated together, like in aggregation, but can also be transformed. Uh, because you deliberate in some sort of a public forum. You have a discussion and uh, the force of the better argument should win, ideally, in this deliberative model. So here you don't only need information on how you can deliberate on, and on how the outcome of this deliberation can then be transformed into some outcome uh, that is a policy or a law, but you also need thinking of the identity element that is really important for deliberative democrats, you need information on, on what your identity is, on what your grievances are, on who the oppressor is, on who is your ally and who is your enemy, and how you can combine together to argue for the same cause in that deliberative forum. So I think this is a different type of information. Um, and information, lack of information, is basically a lack of power. So information asymmetry is power asymmetry. And then we again come to this uh, big concept of power. <laughs> Everything seems to be power, of course, at the end of the day. So if you don't have enough information on how you can make sense of what is happening to you, to your life, then you don't have power to deliberate on it, to push your cause forward. Um, and that's how, uh, when talking about information, we necessarily talk also about power. I'll stop here for now. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't know, the thing that I could add to this is that for some time now, and I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only one to say this, but I've been playing around with a kind of new definition to what poverty is, mm -hmm. and it has something to do with information. And I think to be poor from, I don't know, a cognitive perspective, let's say, is that you either don't have enough information or you don't have the right kind of information um, to help you change your position in the social hierarchy, basically. And that has to do with informational asymmetries that you have mentioned. So it's like, um, it's a really, really difficult problem in a sense. Um, what you were saying as well, because it's not really about people not having access to information anymore. It's not that form of censorship when, when people just either cannot read or the printing machines are all in the possession of the government so you cannot print out your stuff so you're forced to do everything by hand like we did in the 80s in Hungary that we were writing these, I don't know, on stolen, I don't know, printing machines, printed some political material. We don't have those problems anymore, right? But you don't you don't need information, you need the right kind of information. 
uh, and what is the right kind of information for different people to change their own position in social health, just to know about what kind of opportunities they have is is in itself a very, very difficult problem because who's going to put that information together for them? How do you check for that one? Um, how do you um, how do you avoid putting your own self interest in that information that you present to to people? Um, be, you know, you know, can manipulate them to to wherever you want to, wherever you want them to go. So yeah, it's it, it raises all sorts of very important questions with regards to to informational asymmetries. No, very very good solutions that I have heard about this issue so far. There are people who are debating that this is not really an issue and I um and I focus too much on maybe the individual responsibility of, of poor people, whereas someone else is making the argument that maybe the whole system is just game this way and it's just not really about information or poor people not being educated properly, but it's just about the fact that we increasingly live in systems that don't really allow for social mobility. Uh, it's just a fact of, of how this whole thing works. Yeah, I think it, <laughs> I can. Well, I can push back on the thing of of of, um, of scale and localized information. One thing that, um, well, I think maybe everyone ha- if that has been uh, uh, upsetting everyone is the, the situation in the world right now, and specifically what what puzzles me a little bit is um, is the <coughs> the drive that people in a country have to endorse wars, for example. And uh, I think a little bit of what kind of information they're, they're, th- that's given to them, right? So we have been attacked, we are, being, we are in danger. And something that I have, I, I talked to Wuhan before about um, localized decision-making, it's, it's, it, it's in regard to when you make decisions within a community, you are more prone to make decisions that improve your community. And from my perspective, you really, you do not need, or not in this case, you, the, the idea that um, there is a, um, a conspiracy uh, against your country or your ethnicity or something like that does not bring about uh, um, the necessary means that improve your community, right? That's what I'm talking about. Like, I, I, we need on the community um, safety, but we need water, food, or things like that. And, um, and we need, to, we, we need um, information to flow between the individuals who are sharing the same environment for us to bring that about. But then suddenly there is this information coming from above that tells you, well, there is something else that you should be worried about. Something that is, n- it, it doesn't impact your life right now, Maybe it does in a globalized world and uh, where economy it's um, it, it's uh, there is so much capillarity on on the economic uh, economic system, but um, I would I would inv- I would envision a world on which we don't have to worry about that uh, about this this macro narrative that we have to cross the country and go somewhere else to fight for an idea and a story that um, actually doesn't have anything to do with the people who live around me. Yeah, can you, that's an interesting point because it makes me think, is it even possible to have information that is informative that has some kind of identity valence? You know, is it that all the information that we're talking about that is most valuable is structural, possibly historic, anything that gives you an understanding of the context? Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because when you were saying that, what I was thinking about was how much of the information we consume from uh, mainstream media sources, we could define it as something like uh, ones which are typically sponsored by governments, um, whether they're sort of overtly sponsored by governments or just allowed in by governments, um, that build narratives based on identitarian politics. So uh, I'm writing news that appeals to what I think is your identity. And in a sense, by, bu- by doing that, I'm also constructing the narrative about your identity. And so it creates this sort of vehicle for 
me to further attract your interest. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's something there where the, the, the idea that your identity might be built from an external source mm -hmm. is one way to generate power over somebody else. Like we, we've spoken off, off mic, you and I, a lot yeah. about brainwashing yeah. and just how this idea of putting somebody's identity forward is also the process of creating uncertainty about their identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I create something like a need for information and how maybe this is something that uh, speaks both to misinformation, mm -hmm. uh, but then, or maybe disinformation, I forget which one's the intentional one, you'll have to correct me later. Disinformation. But, uh, disinformation, right. So it appeals to something like uh, looking at disinformation, but then also looks at how somebody who maintains the controls the narrative then is the one who has the the political power. Sure. No, I think you're spot on. How, I, were, how I, very Foucaultian. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. discourse creates um, yeah, exactly, subjects yeah. of discourse. Yeah, but but, but what I think what, what it doesn't what what doesn't fit my, in my mind is just um, why there is a need for a grandiose I identity. Uh, uh, um, structure. So why why do we need this grandiose identi identity if we, in, in our local community, within our family, we have our identity. We are a son, we are a daughter, uh, we are someone, um, we are whatever we we are, we are in the world, the identity that we use it in practice. But um, it seems today that we need something else. We need this grandiose identity. We need to belong to, to the glorious past of this nation, or I am a unique person that that that, that doesn't uh, uh, um, kind of fit the, the 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 wave of identities which are not unique around me. I don't know. That's that's what doesn't fit my my in my mind. But I think you're spot on. I think uh, uh, um, that that that's what happens. Um, and I think if we would think locally in how we use our identity to negotiate uh, um, the the decision making process within it pragmatically within the environment in which we have to to achieve things really uh, um, then we have more power balance yeah, maybe it's that the more social pressure that I can put on different populations. Like the more uncertainty I can generate mm -hmm. absent their identity, the more I create yeah. a need to resolve uncertainties through a narrative. So maybe one of the mm -hmm. aspects of power and oppression is that I create a need for some diversion from this mm -hmm. or some way to at least internally mitigate what I perceive as the bigger threats of uncertainty. And that's, oh, hey, everything's going wrong. I can give you a narrative that, mm -hmm. that will pacify you. And I think that sports fanaticism serves this as well, yeah, yeah. Uh, aside from sort of political narratives, but then ethnic or cultural narratives or religious narratives. This is uh, why we see a lot more uh, fanaticism with folks who are typically disenfranchised from a system, uh, both uh, religious, but then also in uh, entertainment based. Uh, maybe, maybe, it's a, maybe it's just a loop, you know, like a, an identity or an, an story of identity is empowering to individuals. So knowing that you belong somewhere in a group and empowers you. And what maybe has been happening is just um, we have been uh, uh, deprived of power on, 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 on the society because of the economic, economic situation that we are. So um, we have been just completely stripped from, from our power. And then we book, we just are trying to 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 gain power somewhere else. And, and to add, I guess to the point of why identities are so highlighted today, I think it's because they have a huge potential for mobilization, mm -hmm. and that doesn't always have to be a negative uh, idea. Uh, we have some post-Marxists such as Chantal Mouffe and uh, the late Ernesto Laclau who argued that the way out of the hegemony of liberal capitalist order is to create a counter hegemony which centers around identities. Identity is a crucial concept for them. And identity has the power to mobilize people who can find mm, different grievances, but the common enemy. And for them, usually the common enemy is the capitalist um, neoliberal but order. But is it usually the case? Because identity can be built no. every, 
for, for any kind of other spectrum that we are talking about, right? For sure, but uh, this is the, just to show that um, it can have positive potentials, as sure. they thought that it could. But they have a very, very dangerous competitor, though, no? Mm -hmm. Because right-wing ideologists usually yeah. have an easier time in distributing mm -hmm. their message because the enemy that they propose is not as abstract as what the left is proposing. So you can, you can create the capitalist system or the establishment as your enemy but it's a lot more abstract than saying that it was the immigrants so that's why you see in many cases like in labor unions right there is a huge danger of them either becoming marxist or become really really far right because yeah, it is a tool of power on, right so it, it doesn't have it doesn't have a, a negative or positive even mm -hmm. uh it's a tool and right. then you, how you use it that's that's how you're gonna get an, an you, outcome that is you mean mobilization Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, identity, identity will, yeah. as you, uh, as mm -hmm. as yeah. you said, um, will make uh, uh, easier to have a, um, um, a decision-making process that is um, uh, the consent of the group. So we, you can do stuff when everybody agrees that we have the same goal or we have the same kind of uh, enemy or things like that. So I think it's a it's a tool and does not have a, a, a valence of positive or negative. You so let me, let me provide a counterpoint. Yeah, do it. <laughs> In I'm going to stake a claim that it's always negative. Always negative. For the reason that if I, if I control what you fear, I control you. That's true. So if I can, and this is, the, this is the crucial point of any system of governance. It's the crucial point of capitalism. It's the crucial point of, of any system which is used to oppress is the, my main goal, if I want to have power over you, is to tell you what you ought to be afraid of. Yeah. And yeah. then, because if I, if I control what you're afraid of, then I control your behavior. But for the outcome, I, 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 I meant that maybe there's no valence, valence on the outcome, because mm. b I, 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 mm. but in the state of the art of the world, mm. yes, I am with you. Yeah. I think it's always negative, because who has the power right now is the ones that control. Uh, 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 well, if you can control masses, then you, you can, you can just like steer them in a certain direction or the other but you can also think that if we say if we are in a different <laughs> words and uh, we say well our our common enemy it, it's uh, uh, global warming uh, and we are all humans uh, that's your identity you are a, a, um, a primate uh, let's act together to make this species survive in this rock then uh, uh, then there is no valence on this on this direction so no you're right in in that sense there's no valence but then you are always susceptible mm -hmm. to yes. manipulation yes right that's true that's and that, true. i guess in that in that sense for me it's always negative in mm -hmm. that once you once you succumb to fear once you are convinced that this threat is existential mm -hmm. then your behavior is manipulable and i think this is the great risk you don't not even have to succumb to it i think there is there is a general presumption here with regards to misinformation and fear inducing beliefs mm. that uh, i come to harbor since i last our last conversation here on this podcast which is the presumption with propaganda and misinformation and disinformation all this sort of bad quality manipulative stuff is that in order for these things to be effective you have to believe them i don't think that's true i don't think that's true mm. i mean you have to think about how do I come in that position as a source to make an epistemic claim about what you should be afraid of? How, how do I come to be that source that get to tell you that? Oh. I, I already have money, most probably. Mm -hmm. I already have some kind of a bargaining power and whatnot. So this is like really, really important way how you, you already have power in order to, uh, to get to this, to this level of manipulation. And you know, if you have that, like for example, what you have in Hungary, I'm not entirely convinced how many people believe government propaganda in Hungary, but it's safer and probably rewarding, even financially, to parrot it back. So, so there, you don't necessarily have to believe it. It's just that if you have enough power over all sorts of types of capitals, then then you get to set the narrative that you want. I do think that there are still some some structural constraints to that. Um, so you cannot just come out of the blue and say that we're afraid of Martians, but no one has seen a Martian. So you have to single out someone who's sufficiently close. Uh, but I don't think that the populace has to believe all these things in order to be manipulated, to be honest. So what, so for me, the, the populace has to believe either the belief that's being sold to them mm -hmm. or they have to believe that not 
not aligning themselves with the group is dangerous. Yeah. So or, one one of those two, and and I can I can wield power over you in with the same exact narrative. Just just yeah. one one tiny addition yeah. to that, which I also this experience comes from Hungary. It's not so much about fear of what what happens when you don't align with the group. It's about how much reward you get out of aligning with the group. I think that's conditioning. A, I think that so is like that is cost. that is that is. I'm I'm just saying that from a purely I don't know behaviorist perspective. Mm -hmm. If a system has the ability to reward you for believing this or public or publicly conforming to that, that is a lot stronger kind of manipulation than making you afraid of what happens if you don't. Is what I'm. That's just 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 a minor detail. No, so no, it's, it's not important. about you being afraid of what happens when you don't align with the group. Is like what kind of rewards do I get from doing so? And yeah. oftentimes you get a lot. So mostly the rewards that are given for believing are with marginalized beliefs. So I get a reward for believing in the flat earth, but I don't get a reward for be believing the earth is round. Because the, anytime some, some group is marginalized for their belief, if you then adopt that belief, you have a big social reward mm -hmm. because the, it's predicated upon this like value system, any cult is like this. But then you have this interesting, and you pointed out, fully valid, is when you have so much power, you can say, uh, not only is there a, ne a negative consequence to not falling in line, police brutality, uh, persecution, right. Um, right? Secret police, whatever it is. But then I can also say things like, well, if you vote for me, I'll give you a cow or yeah, flour potatoes. or a sack of potatoes. Uh, and, and in that sense, I, I, yeah. I also agree. Yeah. And here, but this is also like um, something where the social reward might not be high, the social consequence is high, but because I have so much power, I can also give you a reward that's not necessarily social. And so I think that that's that's an interesting component and and fully valid. So we're we're still at this point where if you the more individuals feel disenfranchised, the more susceptible they are to narratives uh, about that are fear related, right? And which is also why I think for me like every advertisement is selling you something that you are afraid of. I don't think that there's any thing that you can advertise that the concept of advertisement is Road, fear based roller coaster model yeah yeah it make it's people like, feel pain and exactly. fear and then you offer the solution but yeah. then it's not available but then it is available for a limited amount of time and then yet it's yes. just like going up yeah. you know? exactly because and if it I can, can yeah. yeah yeah it can even be something like have this nice thing i don't need to make you afraid but what i'm doing is showing you a negative consequence to not having it mm -hmm. that is all advertising Mm -hmm. It is the dark side of psychology, what can we say? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. If I can add on the uh, basis of obedience, basically, and keeping a population in check or in the system of oppression, I tend to think that fear here is uh, one very important and strong deterrent, sometimes more so than a word. In cases when the reward is absent, I think that fear is the one that is keeping people in check, fear of punishment, and even more so fear of uh, impunability, right, if that is the word, uh, fear of just the oppressor getting away. Uh, and uh, numerous examples exist today of uh, people being uh, still oppressed or people on low uh, social hierarchy uh, being kept uh, in their places, like, again, referring um, to caste system in India. Um, victims of crime and sexual harassment and violence and all sorts of criminal offenses against Dalits, the outcasts or the untouchables in India still today, are um, often um, punished uh, without any repercussions over the authorities and police is often even uh, working with uh, the criminals. Uh, just one example. I'm sure there are many more others. And um, I, I read recently Ambedkar uh, finally finished the annihilation of caste and, uh, and also Arundhati Roy, who give ample evidence of um, examples where they're just un like perpetrators are unpunished and sometimes even socially uh, rewarded for punishing those um, who are just the outcasts of the system. And I think that is what is keeping them in check. And also to go back to the question of whether, um, you know, epistemic belief in your desert to stay in that lowly place is um, less or more um, important here than maybe the system of social conditioning that you talked about, rewards and, and punishments. Uh, I think that 
once um, this constant repetition of these rewards and punishments can lead us, can lead people who are already very low um, to adopt, unfortunately, this epistemic belief that they deserve to be there. And I think that is the most dangerous thing a human being can, can experience to believe what you're told to believe about yourself and your place in the world. And uh, to think that you are there because you deserve to be there and that this is just an objective order of things, whether because of religion or because of the way society works. And after that, it's a point of no return. Yeah, yeah right on. I mean, the, so we create, we create systems which then perpetuate the power that we attempt to maintain. So we, the, the most successful form of dictatorship is one where the average citizen imposes the dictatorship for you. And I think that that's what you're getting at, right? That is a difference, I think, mm -hmm. that Hannah Arendt made between totalitarianism and dictatorship. Totalitarianism is when you also believe and when mm -hmm. this dictatorship permeates through your private <coughs> sphere, it goes into your private realm. Right, right. That That's a, a really nice distinction. So dictatorship is more top down, but totalitarianism is when it's actually affected the point where mm -hmm points and different points in the power structure are actually self enforcing. Yes, it gets through to your through your bones. <laughs> right. And so how do you how do you imagine reconstructing a democracy from that point? Is there the only ways that I can think of are through violence, external involvement? Is there uh, a way, you know, even if you're thinking just a theoretical case, is there a way you can imagine, either of you, of building democratic values, some, some form of democracy uh, into the system almost like subversively to, to reconstruct the system that actually works for the people rather than oppresses the people? Mm -hmm. It definitely has to be a subversion and a disruption of the status quo. And it definitely has to be violence in the sense of the word that denotes disruption. Um, of your own belief about yourself and of the wider system. Hopefully there has to be at least one individual who can look at the situation objectively while still maybe everyone believes that they are where they're supposed to be. And then there has to be some political activity. And I recently read one very nice quote from Rancière, uh, the radical Democrat who said, uh, who gave a definition of political activity. And he said that political activity is shifting your body from a place where it's um, where it is supposed to be, where the society um, devises a place for your body. You shift your body from that place where everyone tells you you have to be. So in that sense, it has to be disruptive. You have to uh, move away from the you know given positions. But how? Through solidarity through solidarity and uh, again, we cannot avoid Marx through <laughs> raising uh, class consciousness and consciousness of uh, the demands that you share together. That's from the top of my head. So uh, I've recently been involved in a summer university where we discussed open society and deliberative democracy and liberal democracy and all these like partially overlapping definitions that are quite hard to tease apart. And obviously there was some talk about policy recommendations as to how to reform democracy, how to achieve better deliberation uh, between interest groups and, and arguments in between interest groups. And hands down, the best argument that I've heard, um, which I think really, really has potential, is that this whole open society and deliberativeness has to translate to an actual physical space and how that physical space is being architecturally designed to foster diversity of communities coming together and deliberating with each other. How can you create a living space for people coming of, I don't know, all sorts of religious backgrounds, all sorts of cultural backgrounds, and they can uh, participate together in all, all sorts of community activities. And it's probably not very, very difficult to do. I'm not even sure whether this kind of architectural approach needs incredible cognitive and psychological insights, but we're still not doing it, right? So I don't know, look at places 
which have all the money in the world, like Dubai, for example. What are they building? Stupid bullshit. <laughs> I, <like laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, they're they're building the world's biggest shopping mall. Congratulations! Yeah. I mean, they, you could have done anything with that sort of money. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the the most well spread um, sort of architectural solutions to people living together is the American suburban home, which is probably one of the worst kind of uh, worst kind of architectural designs to foster this kind of cooperation in between groups because it's so prone to segregation. Um, so I think that that is that is an interesting way to to go so is like what kind of physical spaces should we design for people to to feel that they can deliberate and then they can talk to each other and they can work for common goals and that sort of stuff i think it's just like we can theorize about how to save democracy what did you guys talk about virtual spaces sorry? during the during the uh, the workshop the summer school Uh, virtual uh, spaces. Have we talked about virtual spaces? Yeah, because uh, you're saying, well, you're describing some something that. I yes, mean. yeah. I think it was mostly in terms of like like architectural designs, and you know how in some places I think it was in Denmark, where in some places else they started designing mm -hmm. like these uh, these deliberative mini publics is yes. one uh, concrete institutional, yeah. um, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. the these I don't know. Um, buildings for different uh, branches of the government that are completely transparent and made out of glass so you can see what people are doing in there and how that increases trust and you know it's just like yeah. basic mm -hmm. stuff but still I mean there is just so much to do even the obvious things with regards to virtual spaces yeah fair fair question fair question um, but y you have this problem if you're talking about physical spaces you have this problem of wealth right like, sure Of course, uh, we can name a Scandinavian country that has the money to do it, <laughs> right? Uh, but here you have this this issue of we we have some sense. I don't know if it's an established political theory. It's at least a psychological one where urban areas, uh, wealth and mobility. Yeah, you when you but when you when you have an urban area, you have first of all greater wealth in the urban area in general, uh, but you have more exposure to other individuals. You have a communal living style where the other is not a threat. But when you live in sparsely populated areas, the other on a road that you don't recognize where there's no other human is, is a potential threat. And, and not that this is not the case in, a, uh, in an urban area as well, but you pass by so many people that statistically you're just used to passing by people all the time. There isn't the idea that, that another is a, th a threat. And typically with urban areas, you get a larger congregation of larger numbers of people. I mean, if you look at the history of ethnic rioting, most of them happened in urban areas. So I'm not entirely sure about the validity of that hypothesis, because even if you pass by them, cities get segregated. And, you know, there can be a Middle Eastern district and the China and Chinatown and Japanese town and whatnot. So just like, you know, the design of the city is such that 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 there there's isn't going to be so much meaningful contact in between this because contact is one thing that's 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 a shortcoming of the contact hypothesis in social psychology but it's meaningful what kind of contact it's just passing each other on the street and it's not great if you're cheering for different football teams also not great but if you participate together in labor unions together then then that is a meaningful contact in which you have experience with working with different people towards the same goal and that has a mediation effect on on your prejudices and stereotypes and whatnot. So I think there's an important distinction between whether or not these places are all of a sudden equal because people are interacting mm. versus whether or not they're actually diminishing biases. And I do think that they're diminishing biases and that every election you look at, at anywhere around the world, you can expect that within the country the more progressive political environment wherever it is will be in cities will be in the yeah, city fair enough. uh and so i guess that that there's somehow slightly more tolerance somehow a slightly more communitarian aspect to living in a city even though cities for sure uh remain segregated and sometimes you get great the greatest amount of uh racial wealth disparity mm. inside urban areas so mm. for sure granted I, i completely agree with that but there is this i suppose that There is an interesting thing about the information that we receive on high from something like registered sources of information. There's something about that that isn't as valuable as personal experience. And maybe that's exactly what you guys are getting at with 
put people in the space, let them discuss with other individuals. The anecdotal evidence plays such a big role in in our awareness for whatever reason. Individuals rely a lot on anecdotes that they receive firsthand, sure, rather than information from a study that they that they read online. So sure. there, there is this there's this interesting bias that that individuals have, which then again uh, plays into what people see as fair, what people see as equal. Yeah, I think it's also about the question of. I'm, I mean, I'm talking a little bit against myself here, but I think the media can can do a better job in this in these mediating biases. It's just that you have to make sure that the people have a feeling that the media cares about them unless if that's not the case then they're not going to listen to these sources in the first place so you can have really nice local journalism that is kind of like <laughs> moderately free of biases and then you know they can deliver to you information about how their communities live and i think that should have an effect probably not as strong as actually sharing a living space but if people have trust in the media, then I think it's already a pretty good start. But then you have to start with local media, probably. And the media aside to the point of anecdotal evidence in these deliberative mini publics uh, and deliberative um, groups. Um, yes, this uh, is considered to be an alternative form of speech. And um, the purest form of uh, deliberation by the um, theorists who have, uh, you know, started this turn is that deliberation is about uh, the best argument. Habermas always talks about uh, the force of the better argument sh and that should prevail, that should win over the debate. But then uh, different Democrats like the one that I'm reading now, Iris Marion Young and a few others noted that Mm, deliberation is oftentimes privileging a specific form of rational, what we could find rational, uh, articulate, eloquent argument, dispassionate, devoid of any personal anecdotes or emotions or what would be described as, um, you know, fertile for manipulation or for demagoguery and stuff like that. Logos, logos instead of pathos. Exactly. It's, a, it's an old uh, platonic mm. distinction. Uh, pure rhetoric, uh, rhetoric versus pure rational discourse. And then they make a very important point that you also touched upon earlier, that uh, we need to equally uh, value and hear with the same esteem uh, different forms of speech that are, for example, anecdotes, which she terms as narratives. Uh, people coming out and giving stories, telling stories about their experience, providing some narratives, sharing stuff about them. Then also rhetoric in the sense of um, using styles that could be d d d um, described as uh, sarcastic or or um, ironic or majestic, any kind of style that you want to use to convey a message to influence the, the hearer. And the third uh, alternative form of communication for her is greeting. A very everyday <laughs> thing uh, <laughs> that we do in communication, we greet each other. And this is especially important for her uh, in um, conflict situations, in spaces where we know that we, we cannot really agree on many premises because arguments require that we agree on some premises as we talked off uh, <laughs> the mic. But if you cannot agree on premises, then uh, you have to go start at least with a greeting. And greeting means acknowledging a person in their particularity. When you say, hi, how are you? When you remain polite during the discussion and then when you uh, take leave in the end, you say goodbye. Uh, so all of these uh, things are not to substitute the argument, but are to supplement it. Uh, and to make democracy more inclusive. And this is where we, I think, come to the point of inclusivity that is very important when it comes to power, symmetry and um, information. So you want to make democracy inclusive and in that way uh, you'll make it more equal. Question for you. I t I t I I'm completely with you and I think it's a nice way to think. Uh, well, it's a nice to think about different ways to to negotiate power. And I think I think you didn't even mention, but art came to my my mind com like exactly. straight away. Visual like, uh, elements. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, yeah, we have to, to account for different ways that we can negotiate power. But that comes back to, and because you mentioned um, that there are there are asymmetries on how or, or on our skills or um, ways to negotiate power. 
it comes to a problem that I already thought before. I think I might have just even mentioned to you and to you as well. It's just I people are asymmetric. They are different. And um, how would you deal with a person that doesn't want to negotiate power, doesn't want to participate, doesn't want to to to, to participate on, on on the decision making or maybe for example, in, in the case of greeting, for example, maybe there's a person that is shy mm -hmm. and never greets anyone, but then greeting is value on that environment. Mm -hmm. And that person just like, okay, I I know the greeting is value here as, as, as a, a way to negotiate power, but I I don't like it. I don't, right. I don't want to, how, how do you think about like, and then and then the extreme, just like thinking someone is, I think I think there is there is there is something related to what you said before of people internalizing their position mm -hmm. uh, when they are deprived of power and they just go along. But uh, I believe there is still maybe an extreme of people who are just like okay, I don't want it to participate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. This is uh, a good critique that I also found in the literature uh, that goes uh, along the lines that you just now gave. Also, these alternative forms of speech that are not just rational argument have their downsides and they are prone to abuse and they are also prone to influences mm -hmm. and they are prone to power uh, inequality. Because if narrative is valued, then people who are good storytellers will win the debate. If greetings are valued, then people who are open and um, sociable will win. Uh, if, uh, what was the third one, if rhetoric, I mean, good rhetorician, right, will win the debate. So at the end of the day, it shows that you can never avoid power. And then the question is what to do with it. Um, these are just ways to maybe moderate the threat, uh, not the threat sounds bad, but the inequality that maybe an argument can create um, if you cannot make a good argument or if you are not used to, if your way of expression is not an argument in the deliberation process. Uh, to the point of what to do with people who don't want to participate. Uh, well, I don't think we can force anyone to participate if they don't want to. So as long as they have equal opportunity to participate, mm -hmm. it is their free choice to not participate. And uh, it is also their choice to be apolitical. And mm -hmm. that choice is still a choice at the end of the day, whether um, whether it's a desirable choice from the <laughs> normative point of view. No, it's not. But uh, it's still a choice and it, as, as such, it has to be respected. But do you think that affects the structure of the system that definitely so, just reproduces uh, the status quo yeah. yes yeah can you have a, a system that you call democratic when individuals maybe the system is working well enough to a degree but not enough individuals are participating what does it mean if you have some equal society but 10 percent of the public vote versus a very unequal society a lot of uh, manipulation suppression but then like 90 percent of people go vote which which system is more democratic in your mind uh, the second one where you can uh, where you can still have political equality is more democratic, but of course it's not socially equal. But in the first one where you can imagine to have a socially equal society, but people don't really exercise their right to vote, they don't really exercise their moral agency. So if you don't use your political power, then um, democracy loses something. And also at the end of the day, I make an argument in my thesis, also social equality loses something of its value. Uh, because you choose not to exercise your moral agency. You are less of an agent if you don't make a choice. So we have the, the, then this interesting problem, right? When we look at how we build systems of governance, where we've, if we set up an ideal where everybody has to participate in the same way in order for us to objectively determine that the, that the system of governance is, is fair or equal or democratic, then we also have this, this problem where to be a functioning, uh, high-quality democracy, we need everybody to also be beholden to participation within that society itself, which is this interesting thing, right? Because if we're building, if we're engaging with society, if we're, if we're uh, submitting in one sense to society, there are certain freedoms that we give up in order to gain the benefits of society itself. But then in order for that democracy to to be deemed healthy, then we also have to give up our time and dedicate that to the democracy itself. So then mm -hmm. we have something of this strange problem where uh, society is something of a, of a liberator for sure from 
most existential, immediate existential threats. But then it's something of an oppressor in that I need to engage, no matter how silly or absurd the system is, uh, in order to uh, ensure that the system itself works well. So I guess we have this this problem of power uh, trying to maintain itself and potentially even becoming more oppressive over time if it is unchecked. I, do we? Eat, do you even foresee the ability to build a functioning democracy in that case, where we rely on everybody's participation and engagement? Mm -hmm. Let me think about that. If we don't think that people are capable of um, critically, you know, um, consuming <laughs> this <laughs> pandemic and epidemic of uh, information, and if we don't think that they have the capacity to then make a good uh, outcome, then there is no purpose uh, of democracy at the end of the day if we think that it is bound to fail. But first of all, if we agree with the findings of this um, jury theorem, a uh, Condorcet jury theorem that mm -hmm. says that if an individual is more than 50% likely to get to the correct outcome or to the right outcome, and if there are more such individuals, the more such individuals there are, the more likely we are to get to the right outcome. This is the finding from the mathematical Condorcet jury theorem. So this could be the, the response to this criti critique, uh, critique that, um, you know, we are just bound to fail because we are not competent enough as a, as a society. But nevertheless, yes, I agree that we have to, you know, find some time and to devote some of our free time to political participation. But at the end of the day, at least what I think is that this hinges on one's view of human nature. Uh, for me, people are social beings and for me, people are very much political beings. And here I agree with Hannah Arendt that you are very free in the political realm. I know for myself to go back to uh, anecdotes, but I feel very free when I learn about what is happening uh, with me uh, and to me and to people who live with me in the same world in the same time. Uh, if I don't check what is happening in the world, uh, you might as well, you might very soon feel lost in the world and then you are prone to manipulation. The more you know, the more empowered you are. Knowledge and information is emancipation as long as you can somehow critically assess it. That would be my response. Yeah, I guess my position is not that people are incompetent or incapable. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, it's it's more of this whether or not people have the the energy to actually participate, mm -hmm. and I think that that's my bigger concern. And we had spoken the other day, you and I, about to use a, a case study of the United States, which is just ever uh, present. Um, the both parties determine whether or not a third party can actually engage on the on the public debate stage, mm -hmm. uh, and so. And every media organization is, works with the two large parties, the only two real uh, parties. So there's no way to engage in a meaningful way uh, with a party that is not one of the two. So there's no way to engage and vote and protest that is very meaningful, even though I actually vote uh, always for a third party. Um, but I, I do so on for the impact that it has on, on local elections. But in national elections, when people attempt to protest, there's no real way. And so is this, is this by definition, even a democracy? And, and I guess that, that's something that I go back and forth on a lot of if, you, if your engagement is um, uh, limited, if, if you can engage, but the outcome of your engagement is uh, basically castrated, right? The impact of it. Is that actually a participatory democracy? And is my engagement then actually participation? Is it real participation or is it fanciful? Like, is it, is it just as meaningful for me to just be reading the news uh, as it is for me to be voting? And I guess there's, that's sort of one thought. And the other thought is, um, I, I'm a news junkie as well. I, I, I read, consume a lot of political news. But there's also something that I think about a lot, which is how much of my time and energy is wasted on the theater that could be spent on something else. And in that sense, uh, I, have a, I have a very firm belief that I don't think I could un, unravel, undo, that, that the information that I consume is, is power, right? That it, that it is something like 
Uh, every time I read more information about the political system, I somehow am participating in the democratization of that system. Mm -hmm. So I, I consume a lot of news about the political system in the United States. But I know also that most of it is theater. A lot of it is misdirection. Uh, a lot of it is top down in that they communicate with political parties. And so I don't know how much of my real agency to participate in in other more democratic activities is hindered by my consumption of information, which may just be uh, a wasted effort. Good point, fair enough. Fair enough, yes, definitely there is a difference between consuming news and actually participating in democracy through voting or through deliberation. I'm just saying that it is power in the sense of um, it's a bargaining power. Once you come to deliberation, you will already know uh, what is happening and uh, you will have a hunch on where to go. Um, of course, this is not a perfect example of participatory democracy if two parties are deciding on whether the third party has, um, you know, can enter the game at all. Of course, it's not uh, a perfect definition of democracy. It's not democracy at all. And I mean, mean, we can talk about the state of democracy in America for a long time. <laughs> but um, this is, again, different from then uh, talking about some everyday situation where we feel that our voice, our vote doesn't really matter that much uh, because we live in huge democracies and uh, my vote is just one over two million or two billion uh, of the people who are co-nationals, for example, uh, or who are you know, voting for European elections. This is an, another uh, thing. Um, the way out is definitely to decentralized democracy and to make it more radical in the sense of these alternative forms like deliberative democracy and the way out uh, at least in today's um, day and age <laughs> today's uh, time is to uh, push um, representatives for more accountability and if we cannot do it um, with uh, democratic uh, instruments then uh, do it in, with civil disobedience uh, in order to change the system uh, that will be more representative. So if, we're, if we are engaging in, in building a, a more representative democracy then, and we have more transparency, we also need to communicate that information. And I suppose my, my question to you, Akosh, is do you, have, do you have something like a faith in a, a system of information distribution? Right, because one of the things you mentioned before is getting people in the, in the same space and deliber deliberating, which yeah. I think is incredibly important. But can you can you envisage a a system of of information disbursement that is somehow useful or mitigates some of the risk of of mis and disinformation? So, quick quick disclaimer about that one, and I'm gonna be talking against myself again uh, a little bit. It's just that I see that there is this deep-seated paradox with regards to deliberation and also what humans are using information in general is that, yeah, sure, we have groups within a society that cooperate and within these groups we tend to love each other. But at the same time and on the other side of the coin, we are in competition with other interest groups even within one society. And the funny thing is that if you want to persuade undecided people for your coalition or if you want to mobilize your own in-group to, I don't know, rally for your own interests, then truth is not the best tool that you can use for that. <laughs> because it's fundamentally insensitive to your strategic goals. It might coincide with them, but, you know, it's just like, if you want to win... If you're right-wing, maybe. <laughs> if, you, if you want to win this, this mobilizational game, then you progressively have to start diverging from from reality. But we still have this understanding about oh, how factual reporting and objective information is very important for deliberation. It, 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 that's, that's not the kind of information that people use for mobilization. They use the, and also human argumentation. I mean, what, what we have, uh, you know, all these sorts of theories that people from the department also help developing here is that human argumentation hasn't evolved to reach some kind of an objective truth. It was never a Descartian notion. We use argumentation to persuade each other like lawyers. We're not the judges. We're not the judges. I have to back to differ here to defend my field. <laughs> <laughs> <But> we're, <okay. laughs> 
we're we're not we're not we're not impartial judges that we hear one argument and then the other argument and then we create a synthesis. You can abuse are, everything, including are, arguments. Th- yes. It's it's not like it's an abuse of arguments. They are. This is what arguments are being used. You stockpile biased, one-sided information in order to persuade someone for your own goal because that's the way of doing it, and that's what argumentation is for. So you can tweak that and science if anything has tweaked that sort of argumentative capacity to try to approximate some levels of objectiveness fair enough but when it comes to politics i don't know i don't i'm i'm, I'm starting to think that the problem is not really with, or not necessarily with the information system i mean we just have certain strategic goals when it comes to communicating and when it comes to gathering information and these are at odds with the very democratic ideals that we hold so dear. And that I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to, how to solve this problem, to be honest. Sure, we can talk about how to revitalize local journalism, for example, and it would give people a sense of like, ah, oh, the media cares for me and for my little town and for my problems, so I can sort of open up towards bigger questions that they're communicating about, and that's very, very important. But you know, people have strategic usage behind information. They surely do, but okay. that sounds I want, a bit I want you to respond. Okay. But at first I have to make <laughs> one comment, which is which is kind of amusing to me, is that everybody who seems to work on like misinformation <laughs> either becomes a conspiracy theorist, right? Or like, or, like uh, or no, no, or the opposite, which yes. is what Akosh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is that they just, <laughs> yeah, which is they, they just become a fallibilist. They just, they're, they're defeatist it's, about, it's, you know, it's just like, I'm not, I'm not super, <laughs> I'm not super concerned about people become easily manipulated in certain socioeconomic backgrounds. I see the problem in people becoming so conservative in their already existing beliefs and priors that they're unwilling to update them in light of new evidence. I think that's a little bit of a bigger problem than people becoming too gullible or too easy to manipulate or whatnot. I think just fossilizing in your own beliefs is a lot more is a lot more dangerous because the world changes and all sorts of information come to light and you should be updating yourself and you should change with that but it's just if you lost trust in the sources where the information comes from then you know yeah you get these runaway polarization effects mm-hmm. which which you end up seeing all over so, sorry cut yeah. you off. well for me as a political theorist argument and argumentation is an analytical skill so it's not an objective thing out there in the world. It's not uh, fossilizing um, the status quo or biases. It's just an analytical tool that can be um, sound if the conclusion follows from premises. Sure. Uh, valid, sorry. That can also be sound if you also think that each of those individual premises are plausible. Sure. And so argumentation also invites way of counter argumentation. You can always counter argue something. That is the beauty of this analytical tool. You pr- give an argument, I give an ca- a counter argument, and that is what constitutes some ideal debate. Uh, of course, it can be misused. And the fact that most of, um, I don't know most, but the fact that it is misused and that politicians can abuse it in a way to make an argument that fits, uh, that is not sound, but fits their uh, agenda, uh, is another thing, of course, uh, that is a, a non-ideal uh, situation. Uh, that is not to say that there are some sound arguments out there given by some political sure. options. It's just a problem that maybe they're not, uh, they're invisibilized. They're not sure. as available, as you said, sure. as they should be, as they deserve to be. Uh, but for sure, uh, scientists and even more uh, theorists who only work with arguments like I do, only thing I do is work, is, is provide arguments in my thesis, uh, we should still argue against or for things that are in the world, that exist already, or things that we would want to see in the world. So in that sense, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm less uh, <laughs> skeptical. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree okay. that there, there should be an ideal theory about what argumentation is. What I was talking about is what it has evolved for originally. And this is something that we have to think about when we design these deliberative systems, that human argumentation was never inherently a uh, a tool for reaching the truth. It was a tool to persuade each other to do manipulation for all sorts of reasons. And we have managed to abstract away from that one in the past few hundred years in order to use argumentation, which is, I agree, an incredibly powerful tool for 
I don't know, reaching some kind of a consensus or figuring out what's going on or approximate some levels of objectivity and all these kind of things. But fundamentally, this was a tool for something okay. else. And whenever we design a deliberative system, we should keep this in mind I because this is why. going to come up. I don't see why, because that is is odd fallacy. The fact that something is like that or originated like that, as you also said, doesn't mean that it ought to remain like that. Mm. So, you know, yes, we should keep in mind that and also other stuff, but we should still use it. I mean, that sure. is the main tool. So. Sure. It's just, yeah, for example, yeah. you mentioned the Condor Sagery theorem. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, I understand that this has something to do with the wisdom of the crowds kind of stuff. Yes. The problem is that all of these theories presume the independence of errors from the from the side of the individuals, that their errors there are going to be independent from each other, there's going to be individual errors in their reasoning. And if you scale this one up, then it's they sort of cancel each other out. Yeah. The problem is that these errors are not independent from each other because our, because our minds are systematically biased towards certain kind of information and even certain kinds of argumentation. So we have to and take this with... And they're influencing one another. That's yes. why I'm not supporting Condorcet. Yes. That's just an example of supporting <laughs> deliberative democracy that, yeah. for yeah. that exact reason. Yeah, yes. yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that, that this... I'm not saying that, you know, this too has evolved for this quote, but particular coalitional reason cannot be used for something else. I think, if anything, we have shown that abilities that we have developed for, I don't know, a certain kind of reason can be used flexibly in, in other realms of society. I think we're really good in that. But nonetheless, we have to take this into account if we want to change it. We have to know what it is. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit with Akos on this in that uh, when, when, we look at, when we look at the function of argument, there's, there's my work fundamentally says that there's no unbiased cognition, right? Like I am also yeah. a cognitive scientist. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is the this is this is the one problem. Right? We, it's that like as optimistic as we might be, there's no such thing as unbiased cognition. In that all all cognition is motivated. And that's exa exactly where I started from today. No, no, and it's okay. not that and it's not that it's not like um this is not like an outright disagreement of what you're saying. In that. The pragmatic solution is uh, discussion is all we have. There, there's no way right. that, and and also the human mind is all we have. So we're not going to transcend humanness, right? Um, so, but I, I do agree that this is a, an important thing to understand that a lot of people ignore is that rhetoric, uh, especially you know in historically developed in the Aristotelian sense, was explicitly uh, developed in order to convince, and it's still that. And I think that recognizing that it is still that is really important because while we have uh, logic, right, which is not some abstract colloquial term uh, use of the term, but actually literally predicate calculus uh, in order to ensure that the terms have explicit relationships with one another and that consequences follow logically, meaning uh, that they are consistent with the relationships that we set and the axioms that we set, this is not necessarily how we function when we speak. And I think that that's really important for all of us to keep in mind, particularly because even though I can build a really uh, coherent argument, which follows from all my premises, my premises can be bunk. They can be um, fallacious. So I, this is one of the core things, even when we get to science, and this is sort of uh, where the most critical contributions of the philosophy of science, particularly the feminist philosophy of science comes in, which is there's no way to ignore your biases. So you have to make your biases clear. And I think one of the things that we miss, and this is this is to your point, uh, Christina, is that when we have the discussions, I think we have to begin the discussions with saying what our core beliefs are. And to me, one of the, somebody who's trustworthy to me, whether I agree with them or not, starts from their basic premise and builds up into complexity. But if I'm trying to manipulate somebody, I'm gonna start with a conclusion that appeals to them, and then I'm going to logically bring them back to my axiom to the point where every step is logical, even though my axiom is problematic, they've accepted so many conclusions that they might be persuaded towards the, the premise. So I might say, you don't have a job. Uh, you know, you're, uh, you used to have a job, and now you look around and the demographics of your town are changing. You know, I might build this argument and at the end is these people shouldn't be in the country. And I've said, oh, yes, 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 yes. And I get to the end and I'm like, oh, maybe. And so this for me is how I try to identify 
untrustworthy folks is you start with the conclusion. I want you to start with the axioms all the time. And maybe if we if we focus more on this when we do public debate is what are our axioms, even though maybe we have debates to change one another's axioms, right? Like um, an immediate example is like, a, you know, is the, um, it, is the British Museum an inherently racist institution? You know, I, we could, if we're having that argument, we shouldn't not start with uh, yes or no. We should start with yes or no, so that I know where you're coming from, you know where I'm coming from, and then there is no facade about what our argument is. It's very clear. And maybe this is just, we've reached the point of um, what formal debate and debate teams do, right? Uh, but yeah, it's it's crucially important and we can't ignore what, what discussion gives us. And you have just clarified the point that uh, I was trying to make. If you start from the conclusion, that's not exactly how a sound argument goes. For arguing, you start from premises. You can say if A, uh, then B, and if not B, then not A, but you still have to start from A in this modus tollens example. And I think what you've been talking earlier about was an example of a rhetoric. You know, rhetoric is about persuading people and about, uh, con you know, swaying someone to your, uh, about creating an effect uh, on the person who is listening to you. And uh, this is still the distinction I want to make. Um, but just, no, I, think I guess my... Just, just really oh, yeah, quickly yeah. to yeah. come in here. I would take that as the definition of all human communication, to be honest. Rhetoric. Yes. Now, what, what you just said, it's not, for me, in my mind, it wouldn't be a definition of only rhetoric. Every, every human communication has the goal to change the other person's mind and to have some kind of a cognitive effect. And it, it is manipulation, human communication, and it's very, very basics. So I think we need a better definition to, to distinguish the I two. I was thinking of the framework of deliberative democracy. Mm -hmm. I could agree that all of human communication is about trying to have some effect on the listener, yeah. mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, but in deliberation still, I would make this distinction. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the thing is that when you talk about um, if A, then B, the, in the world, outside of formal logic, mm -hmm there is no necessary consequence, right? Uh, there is no absolute truth to point to. Sure. And I think this is the, this is the issue. Mm -hmm. um, this is the only thing I would take fault in, in, in take issue with in, in what you said. Otherwise, I think we're in complete agreement, is that when I build a, the logical argument, it can make sense, but all of these things are opinions. Nothing follows, it can follow with reason if you accept the reasons I'm giving, the justifications I'm giving. But you could say, oh, um, this uh, A caused B because of P and Q, but I can say I don't believe P and Q. Yeah. I think the institutions that you're citing P and Q from are not valid. And so this is, this is one, of the, one of the issues, is that no matter how much justification and reason we might use to build a logical argument and how much we believe in the premise, the axioms that we set forth, people can take issue not with the structure of the argument, but the justifications for the steps that we take in the argument. And I think this is the most insidious part of the current trend of mis and disinformation, is we actually get the, this problem of people not trusting the institutions which are necessary for me to build the argument. If I'm building an argument about statistics and you don't accept the statistics from the World Health Organization mm -hmm. or uh, a hospital or, you know, um, somebody else's uh, military or somebody else's government intelligence, somebody else's, uh, the, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency, we, we're never going to agree, no matter how reasonable uh, the premises are. And I think this is, this is one of the most difficult things about the, the state of the world at, at the given moment. Not yeah, I think, I think there is a big distance between what we... Uh, the information that we or the arguments that we have to use to make decisions in the real world in uh, simple axioms as A, B, and C. So if you say the statistics of the World Health Organization, someone just say, yeah, but the methodology that they use was like this and it's not like that. So A is actually not A, A is actually C, and C is not B, but you know, so it's, it's, it's the thing is just like information, the, the information that we have to deal with today it's so opaque if you compare with the information that one where our brains uh, uh, developed, like uh, uh, evolved. You know, it's 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 not the same environment. And one thing that we use is to share cognitive labor. We trust in other people. We trust that other people know something better that we know, and therefore they might be better equipped to deal with that information than us. And then maybe if that person tells me that this is A and not B, and then okay. Uh, I ha part of this of this problem 
of figuring out and unpacking it, I, I, I gave it to that person, that person did that, so now I can deal with the rest of the of the argument and make my decision there. And because I was thinking on how we can mitigate that, and because Akros uh, mentioned uh, how on the scientific environment, we we partially mitigated, although we have like old scientists still like lingering to old ideas and being mm-hmm. like, and how, 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 but how do we partially mitigate it in science is by also cognitive uh, 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 distribution uh, uh, distribution of cognitive labor, right? So we have these people who are specialized in something. And then if you come up with an idea study and then you bring it to a room with a lot of peers of yours, everybody that read the same thing that you did, everybody that have spent the same time that you did, they're going to say, this is wrong because A, it's, it's, and B, it's not C. And uh, you both know that A is A and B and B. And, and C and C, so you can agree if it is C or not, right? And um, and my argument comes back to what I said at the beginning. I think for a democrat system, we need decentralization of of decision making, because then you are dealing with people who are specialized in the problem that they are dealing with. They are an environment and where they are dealing with the problem daily life problems first ran, first hand and then they get together with other people who are dealing with the same problem and then they make a decision because they all know what the problem is right they know, all know what are the axioms they are dealing with and then we being so distanced from the problems that we are trying to solve that's that's a problem so are you are you advocating for technocracy here mm-hmm. no it's not technocracy I, i'm saying i'm saying uh, uh, what what does <laughs> technocracy know? <laughs> Look, who who is the decision on where a uh, uh, daycare facility should be on right. on a on a neighborhood? Right. The people who have kids, not not a guy who sits in the in an office, uh, uh, thousands of kilometers a- away from that neighborhood. Mm. That's all that I'm saying. Mm. Exactly. You know bringing vulnerable groups and groups uh, for whom these re- these really problems really matter into exactly. the policy making uh, process and this is one move towards what should be done and of course I agree with everything you said earlier about uh, describing the situation we are right now in of course we know it's not uh, uh, enviable situation but as a normative theorist I never really think about what is happening now because I know that what is happening is not something that I like <laughs> most of the times so and I always try to think what should be done and this is one uh, you know move towards what should maybe be done i think in like sorry in like um in, in in defense of all of this is just that i think where science have prevailed was not necessarily only have to do with working with other people where science prevailed over biases was that we have come up with a methodology it's not it's not the with the science Sorry? With arguments. No, about how these <laughs> arguments how these arguments should be structured. Uh it's not merely the arguments. But yeah, it, you know, there's this there's this um bon mot that comes from journalism mm. that it's not the journalists who have to be unbiased. It's the method that has to approximate <laughs> yeah. some levels of unbiased. Obviously, obviously the scientific so, method yeah, is and, it and is important, we, but it can, is also if, applicable in real life. Sure, sure. We can we right, can come so up with it, a it method. Works or now doesn't. arguing for my point. Thank you. We can we can <laughs> we can come up with a methodology, supposedly, that is somehow going to play around these biases that humans bring from, you know, whatever evolutionary heritage to this whole game. And then we can make that methodology sufficiently flexible so we can change it when the information environment changes or some new technological information comes because it has to be flexible at the end of the day. Mm-hmm, you cannot mm-hmm. just leave them there. That's one of the no, main sure. one of the main advantage of having like codified methodology or editorial guidelines in newspapers that when Whenever there is a change, you can update it quicker than the human mind. Mm-hmm. That's the main advantage. Cultural evolution is quicker than biological evolution, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think it, it's it's really the methodology of this whole deliberation that we that we can focus on at the end of the day. So, one of the things that in science um, is that you know I, I don't believe in a removal of biases, but we can potentially mitigate some biases. But one thing that the method does is attempt to remove argument by presenting data. 
And so you have different types of scientific papers that you might write. Some might be review papers in which an argument may or may not be put forth. Sometimes it is. You have a theoretical paper where almost certainly there's going to be an argument. And then you have sort of the standard empirical paper where you can put an argument and, and maybe some or a lot of people do. But the sort of traditional, simple, bare bones uh, production of science is this is what we did. This is what we found. Here it is. And th with no argument, just this is what people did before. This is what we did this time. This is what there is. Um, and the biases are in people's decision making process, which are not transparent uh, before uh, in the in the reading of the paper because the biases are in the variables, the decisions they made to, to build the experiment. So the biases are sort of baked in. Um, but all you get is the finished product of an ideally argumentless product, which is data driven. But when we consume information outside of the scientific realm, the narrative helps us understand the context and the contrast because we're sure. not always dealing with something sure. very specific. Whereas scientists, we, we're reading the papers all the time, we're embedded in context. Context, mm -hmm. our, our expertise is the context with when, which, with which uh, even, we generate. Even more. we need allegories and metaphors and all these kinds exactly. of you yeah, know yeah. things that help us to simulate what's going on. Even from very, 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 you know, ingrained in one, one scientific context, I find it sometimes incredibly helpful if, 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 <laughs> if one comes up with a good metaphor that is just like helps set in constant click. Yeah, analogies is the core of cognition. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely get that. Um, but if we don't, if you don't have any other points to make on on that specific thing, I'd like to I'd like to put another question uh, just in in the middle, um, maybe actually towards Christina again, right? About because I agree I agree with um, everything that's been said about the decentralization helping democracy, but uh, to to kind of building off Guilherme's point, maybe it's to both of you is um, how do we leverage specialization mm -hmm. and and also decentralize when our um, determination of expertise is built upon institu institutions. So the only way for me to determine that somebody's an expert is I have to have some, some way, some institutional centralized validation of that expert, right? Either that or we're all looking to different people that we determine are experts. So is there a way to, <laughs> to decentralize, but then also somehow centralize uh, expertise? Unions. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> nice. Okay, yeah. But but so like so unions for unions for science, unions for I, yeah. I guess I'm not just intellectual expertise of every type of expertise, and I guess unions is yeah. is good. Yeah. So then, but I guess you have a problem of unions also have this problem of of high centralization, right? And yeah. so is it that we always need a balance when we say decentralization? Is it that? I am accepting some centralization, uh, but then decentralization of other parts. We, yeah, from my perspective, there is there is no way uh, w we have to deal with a certain level of centralization in order to be effective. So my my whole idea is always let's try to make the best out of it, and uh, the best out of it is not relying on on, on extreme centralization of decision making and trying to push as much as you can towards the periphery on where people who are marginalized cannot make decisions, but within my idea, they would make decisions that matter for their own lives. Um, but um, yeah, hierarchies will still exist. Some centralization will still exist. Some fairness will still exist. People are still born different. And we have to do with that in the best way that we can. So maybe I can make some really um, naive, rough split. Um, is it that in decision making, we need more decentralization, but in production, we need more centralization in order to develop expertise? Yeah, I'm just sort of naively putting it out there without thinking uh, about it. The, the problem of production for me is that, well, do, do we need to, well, with the society that we live now, we have to increase production, we have to increase eff uh, um, effectiveness on, on, on our production, but um, it's not that clear that it's always necessary, right? Um, at least not for me, it's not obvious. Well, there's, there's, a, there's arguments of, of in, in, uh, for um, uh, treating the problem or uh, the issue of uh, global warming, which is reducing 
effectiveness on, on our system of production, actually. Say, hey, let's live with, with a little bit less. Let's, let's, uh, let's slow down and that's, we're going to be fine. And so it's not, it's not very clear for me. I think it, it, it is still nice, uh, from my perspective, we still have to advance science. We still have to advance uh, um, uh, engineering and um, try to make the best um, that we can make of reality um, as, a, uh, as, as a species that can achieve so much together. So f in, in that sense, yes, uh, uh, centralization of decision making will be important. Uh, but uh, I don't think that it has to be the gigs of the gig of everybody. If you wanted to have uh, communities that produce and offer themselves, if you have to have, um, if you want to have, um, you, you you can have it. Uh, um, I don't think that's. Um, I don't have. To, I don't think you have to have everybody on board. Yeah, right. Um, because one of the important things is this idea that we need to always increase production mm. is is a huge problem. Yeah. And so some of the expertise we need to rely on is when people say we need to produce much less. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, um, yeah, I guess then maybe the maybe you answer the question in this way, which is that when we look at expertise, maybe there are some domains in which we need some kind of centralization and, and unions of uh, across um, a larger geographic scale. But when it comes to even meeting basic needs, maybe we don't need um, production that that's that centralized. I mean, I guess I in so. some sense you need it because food production in different spaces is going to be mm -hmm. different. You can't produce food in the Arctic or in mm -hmm. deserts, arid areas are going to be difficult. Um, yeah, that that is quite interesting. Yeah. And I think I think people are uh, humans are um, um, we are driven to 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 some s certain level of of productivity. So naturally, we wanted to make things and we wanted to produce things. We want to make art. We wanted to build things. We want to. We want to. So it's not a big concern of me, of mine that. Uh, um, that's not going to happen. I think we find a ways and uh, we get together and we make it. We make it happen. Does the centralization problem... Yeah. It's a very interesting uh, dichotomy and dialectics between centralization and decentralization there, when, when you also mm, throw the problem of uh, expertise and uh, I guess assuming that expertise is the grounds for legitimacy then also and for obedience. Um, I've been thinking about this uh, in different terms, but it's the same topic. So decentralization for me means uh, more political equality and more equality in political power, more balance in it. If you decentralize it, everyone has relatively equal, you know, political power in their hands. Uh, and that, again, as you are familiar with my argument, increases social equality. Uh, that can very well, um, you know, if it is empirically true, that can very well undermine efficiency or maybe even create worse outcomes from the point of view of, I don't know, what you find that correct outcomes are empirically. Uh, but I think that we cannot have both and we need to specify the value that we find most desirable and most important for the society. And then we have to bite one bullet. Uh, but perhaps that's not the end of the story. So uh, personally, I would bite the bullet of um, saying that I want decentralization uh, and maybe undermine efficiency or undermine correct outcomes, but that will give us social equality. Uh, but as I said, it doesn't have to be the end of the story there because if we remember what John Stuart Mill said, and I hate to quote John Stuart Mill, but uh, he was uh, very famous for also saying that, you know, practicing democracy increases moral capacities and also intellectual capacities. That was one of his arguments why women also should uh, be franchised, enfranchised, um, uh, because the assumption was that they don't have capacity uh, for political life. Mm, so the uh, answer here could be that, yes, although now we are not experts, we could become experts because we are forced to be experts in the maybe local fields that matter to us. So by doing political, um, you know, making political judgments, doing politics in a way, you will be forced to make uh, good decisions or decisions that you think are the best in that uh, sense. And that can be compatible with decentralization. 
Uh, that, that's super interesting. So uh, looking at, at decentralization as a tool of empowerment, specifically because it forces individuals to engage and build their own knowledge base uh, within the domain. Yes. That is really interesting. And I guess the first thing that comes is, yeah, I mean, if, if we all separate, um, you know, in the event of a, of a nuclear war, which is becoming more and more likely, and uh, the, the global infrastructure collapses and uh, a million of us are left to fend for ourselves in different parts of the planet. Even more um, likely. <laughs> <laughs> PhD um, students. Yeah, 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 right. It's like um, the individuals are going to build their own expertise about how to till the land, how to forage, and uh, yeah, which is, which is, I guess, maybe one of the most insidious things about centralization of power anyway is that it robs individuals of right. their sovereignty over mm -hmm. their own domain. Mm -hmm. That's that. That is really interesting. Completely on birds, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. All right, we solved the problem. <laughs> Sweet. Um, well, next I have, time I have been saying that yeah, to you yeah. all like for yeah, years yeah. now. I mean, we've we've been we've been agreeing on it. Let's but. create an anarchist society right yes. here, yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, as of now, we've taken over uh, the the podcast studio, and we're not leaving. <laughs> um, next time, we solve world hunger. Uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, then I guess we can end it there. Um, thank you so much. Unless anybody else has anything else to say, and if you guys want any other any other takes on things, we can have another podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. Please, if if there are any other things you want to discuss, uh, if next time you want to bring a political scientist ally uh, and give us some give us some tongue lashings, then I uh, think I convinced then, you. <laughs> no, you did. You did. It was, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank for, you for, for inviting us again. again. It's been thank a you pleasure. for coming. <laughs>